I don't have a squid. Ay, ay, ay. It's in my office. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Andrea Jenkins, and I am going to call to order this regular meeting of the Minneapolis City Council for September 22nd, 2022. Clerk, please call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Chavez. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Goodman. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Councilmember Osman. Present. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Shugtai is absent. Vice President Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 12 members present. Let the re record reflect that we do have a quorum. Colleagues, we have a number of um, resolutions to present this morning, honorary resolutions, and we will begin with the first honorary uh, resolution honoring Coach Larry McKenzie. There we go. <laughs> All right. Honoring legendary high school basketball head coach Larry McKenzie for his dedication and service to North Minneapolis U. Whereas head coach Larry McKenzie, after 24 years of leading high school basketball programs, has retired from his career of service to Minneapolis U. And whereas from 2000 to 2003, Larry McKenzie was the first coach to four-peat as state champion in the 2000-2003 with the Patrick Henry High School basketball team and the third where is. <laughs> where is? Larry McKenzie coached North Community High School basketball to consecutive state titles in 2016 and 2017. And whereas Coach McKenzie has the top winning percentage ever in state tournaments at 90.9%. And whereas Coach McKenzie has been inducted into the Minnesota High School Basketball Hall of Fame, rightfully earning his seat among the most successful basketball coaches in the state. And Whereas Coach McKenzie has become a reverend community, uh, revered, not a reverend, a revered community leader, <laughs> mentor, and father to the North Side, and is it there? It is. Whereas, over the course of his career, Coach McKenzie maintained his academic standards, resulting in 100% of his players going to going to two or four year school post graduation. And whereas in his words, Coach, Coach McKenzie has taught each of his students to be a champion, first in the classroom, in the community, in the family, and lastly on the hardwood. 
And whereas Coach McKenzie has shown unconditional love towards his students as a beacon of hope and healing after the murder of George Floyd, the, the murder of North athlete Deshaun Hill Jr. during the COVID-19 pandemic and go, ongoing community violence. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby extend their sincerest gratitude for Coach Larry McKenzie's 24 years of service to North Minneapolis youth, and I will say to the entire Minneapolis community, and will continue to support him in all of his adventures to come, both professionally and personally. Congratulations, Coach. Yay. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank the uh, thank God for the opportunity to be here, understanding that everybody didn't get the gift this morning. Secondly, I always I, I got a few special people in the audience. If they all could just please stand, uh, former players, community people. Uh, because nobody does anything by themselves. And so I want to thank you all for all the support that you've given me. And then lastly, one of my favorite quotes says, fortunate is the person that sees a need, recognizes the responsibility, and actively pursue the answer. For me, basketball and mentorship saved my life. I'm here because somebody invested in me uh, and uh, made a difference in my life. And so for me, I've always wanted to use the game, and I tell people, unlike a lot of folks that have gone into coaching, for me, basketball has always been a ministry and an opportunity to use that little round orange ball to change lives. And so I'm thankful to be recognized for the work that we've done uh, and to know that there's still a lot of work out here to be done. So thank you all for the recognition. Coach McKenzie, so much of it has already been said. You know, it, it's not just about the state championships, which you have done at record level. It, it's not just the Hall of Fame honors, which are more deserved than ever. It's what you've contributed to our community, on the basketball court, off the basketball court, on the north side, throughout the city of Minneapolis. People revere you. People respect you. Uh, people understand that the mentoring that you give on a daily basis has extraordinary impacts for decades to come. You mentioned just a second ago that you're here today because somebody decided to invest in you. You have invested in hundreds if not thousands of kids, of youth uh, across our city, across our state. Undoubtedly, it has a gigantic impact on behalf of our entire city. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's always awkward when we have multiple resolutions, but our next um, honorary resolution is honoring the first all-women fire crew in the history of the Minneapolis Fire Department, and that resolution is going to be read by Council Member Jason Chavez. If I can get our amazing firefighters up here. Today, we recognize and celebrate the commemoration of the 30th anniversary of the first all-woman crew in the Minneapolis Fire Department history. Let's give another warm of applause. <laughs> 
The Minneapolis Fire Department was established in 1879. The first woman was hired as a firefighter for the department in 1986, which was over, way over 100 years after the foundation of the department. Among the early hires were these incredible women who on September 1992 made up the first all-woman crew in department's history in Station 5. Today we celebrate Captain Jean Kidd, Fire Motor Operator Mary Moan, Firefighter Vicki Hoff, Firefighter Bonnie Blaskochik. Can we give them another warm of applause? As we seek to develop policy solutions in this body, we must do so with our firefighters in mind and continue to support its diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's important to know that in the early 2000s, our fire department included 70 women, and now there's only 38 in the department. I wanna thank you for serving our communities, for your past and present work, for supporting our beautiful East Lake Street corridor, your dedication to our neighborhoods, and for protecting the constituents of Minneapolis. I'm gonna read the resolution and then also thank some people on the planning committee that helped make this possible. Whereas the Minneapolis Fire Department was established in 1879, and whereas the first woman was hired as a firefighter by the Minneapolis Fire Department in 1986, over 100 years later, since then, women have served in all ranks of the Minneapolis Fire Department. And whereas in September 1992, four women who were among the early hires made up the first all-woman crew in the Minneapolis Fire Department. Whereas Captain Jean Kidd, Fire Motor Operator Mary Moan, Firefighter Bernie Blaskochik, and Firefighter Vicki Hoff were the first crew in Engine 5 on the 2700 Bloomington Avenue South, Minneapolis, from 1992 to 1994. And whereas these four women served as a driving force for positive developmental change and evolution of not only the Minneapolis Fire Department, but the Fire Department worldwide. And whereas by 2002, Minneapolis was a world leader with the Fire Department that included 70 women firefighters, 15% of the department today. In 2022, there are 40 women, 10.3% of the department. And whereas while only one of the first 17 cadet classes since 1986 did not contain women, 11 of the 17 did not, until most recent class of August 2022, which counted for four women among its 23 graduates. The Minneapolis Fire Department had only hired 10 women in the last 20 years. And whereas the Minneapolis Fire Department hiring practices over the last 20 years have not kept pace with predictable and seniority-based attrition that's contributed to the will and continue to contribute to the decrease of the percentage of the department made up of women. As a result, the department is on a clear trajectory to fall below the decimal 4% nationwide count of career firefighters who are women. And whereas the composition of the fire first graduating class under the current chief, Chief Tyner's tenure, illustrates his and the Minneapolis Fire Department's intention to recruit and hire diverse candidates, including consideration of gender diversity. The August 2022 graduating class had four women, and the cadet class scheduled to begin in September 2022 will start with four women. And whereas Fire Chief's stated goal to improve the department's diversity must have the support and effort of the entirety of the city enterprise. This necessary and honorable goal will require the city and fire department to develop specific, intentional, quantifiable actions and policies to improve their diversity, including gender diversity, and in institutional and organizational practices, including hiring, training, retention, and promotion. And whereas all our efforts to reverse the gender diversity trends should be rooted in an intentional approach that considers race, class, sexual orientation, and other identities to ensure a culture of inclusion, diversity, and belonging within the Minneapolis Fire Department. And whereas the Minneapolis Fire Department should return to the trailblazed by the four women on the 1992 Engine 5 crew and recommit to the policies, practices, and strategic investments that will reverse the gender disparity trend, eliminate institutional sexism, and ensure the outcomes and opportunities for all people that are not predictable by gender. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby commemorate Captain Jean Kidd, Fire Motor Operator Mary Moan, Firefighter Bonnie Muscatchik, and Firefighter Vicki Hoff, the first all-woman crew in the Minneapolis Fire Department history. The city of Minneapolis gives you all a thanks for your dedication and service to the city of Minneapolis. We have more resolutions. The other resolutions are in my office. <laughs>
So we're going to give you all the resolutions here. They're in my office right now. Okay. If my staff can bring them, that would be very helpful. Oh, they're right here. <laughs> <laughs> and if you all would like to share a few words, that would be very great. But I also wanted to thank a few folks on the planning committee. So we have Christy Nixon, Sherry Wisanen, Assistant Chief Rucker, Chief Tyner, Tony Frazier, Raven Neville-less? Neville, Neville's. Director Mo, Kate Nelson from the Ward 12 office, Orin Chowdhury, Zainab Mohammed, and Daniel from the Ward 9 office, and then Suzanne Murphy, who was a former city employee in the Ward 12 office as well. They have also been working on this the entire year, working really, really hard to make sure that like this, this is a possibility to celebrate our amazing woman in the fire department. So if you would like to share some words, we would be really thankful. Yes. <laughs> Hey, thanks. I, I, uh, it's been an honor to work on this for the last couple of years. And, and uh, I want to thank Councilmember Chavez, Councilmember Johnson. Uh, I reached out after Station 24, the first all-black brigade was recognized. And I thought, wow, how about we do this recognition of these women who are still here instead of waiting 110 years? And so uh, we brought them in from out of town. And... I'm really, really proud of the leadership and capabilities that they showed a long time ago, 30 years ago, because without them, there would be no me. I retired from the department about four years ago. I only served 16 years, and they served much longer than that at Station 5. And I hope you all can join us tomorrow at another celebration, 10 a.m. Well, they'll speak longer in some of the leadership of the fire department and other uh, women firefighters will speak. Also today at noon, we have a question and answer session at the public service building? Service, okay, <laughs> which is nearby. So noon, they'll get to tell some of their stories. It's going to be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is this working? And then I have one more. And then if... My Latino brothers, sisters, and siblings can come up here, the ones that worked on this resolution. Hello, 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 como están? Gracias, no, gracias a usted. Happy Latino Heritage Month. During this month and throughout the year, we share our history, our heritage, and accomplishments of the Latino community. We are essential workers, healthcare providers, small business owners, teachers, fast food workers, and most importantly, your neighbors. And as we think about our community during this month, it's important to know that our community is still forced to hide in the shadows because of our unjust immigration system. The healthcare disparities run rampant in our community because of the lack of access to healthcare that our community still fears to this day when driving without a license, not only in the city of Minneapolis, but across the state. We deserve to be represented in government, to be mentioned and reflected in our budgets, to receive the same attention as everyone else. And as I read this resolution today, I think about the amount of policy work that this body can do to support our Latino community, who makes up 10% of the city of Minneapolis population. I also want to say thank you to the Somos Employee Resource Group members who have worked really hard on this resolution. Silvia Gonzalez as the ERG chair, Mariano Espinosa, the Latino Community Specialist for the City of Minneapolis, Director Rivero from the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, the folks up here who make up Somos and are dedicated to our city employee resource group, and all the folks working really hard for all the events if you've seen, they're posted all over City Hall that the Somos group is hosting in, in regards to Latino um, History Month. I'll read the resolution. Whereas from September 15th to October 15th, the United States celebrates Latino Heritage Month. And whereas September 15th marks the anniversary of the independence for several Latin American countries, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, with Mexi Nicaragua and Mexico commemorating its independence on September 16th and Chile on September 18th. 
and whereas many Latino Americans and descendants of indigenous groups, including the Arawaks, Aztecs, Mayans, the Incas, the Maya, and the Tainos, and many individuals who identify as Latino share additional cultural roots, including African or Afro-Latinos and Asian Latinos. And whereas Latino Heritage Month is a time to learn about both the resiliency and of this vibrant American community and the oppression it has survived in acts of colonization, state section persecution, and formidable removal. I also want to give time to maybe folks up here to actually read it with me. So I'll pass it to you, Sylvia. Whereas the United States is home to 61 million Latinos, making it the largest ethnic and racial community in the country, with over 44,000 Latinos living in Minneapolis, composing 9.6% of the city's population. Whereas Minneapolis Latinos contribute to the city in many ways, including educating the city's children, bringing rich arts and cultural practices to our city, and establishing and maintaining businesses in important commercial corridors like Lake Street, Nicollet, and Central Avenue. And whereas out of the city's total workforce, 229 individuals, <clears throat> can I say that again? 229 individuals, or only 6% identify as Latino, and Latino Heritage Month is a call to action to achieve a Latino employee workforce comparable in size to the city's Latino residential population in furtherance of the city of Minneapolis equity goals. I'm going to pass it. And whereas the city of Minneapolis established SOMOS, the Latino Employee Resource Group, to foster a sense of community within the city's Latino and Latino-connected workforce, and to recruit, retain, and promote more Latino employees in, at the city. And whereas Latino Heritage Month is an opportunity to reflect on the future of our city, the important role Latino residents play in growing Minneapolis, and the contributions that people with roots in Latin America have had and will have on our city's innovation, cultural assets, and identity. Uh, whereas we stand solidarity with Latinos escaping humanitarian crisis and in a stability attempting to find safety, freedom, and welcome in the United States who instead experienced death, exploitation, jailing, separation from family members, and uh, transport to locations around the country where they have no contact or resources. And... We soundly reject the unlawful and inhumane acts that have been perpetrated upon individuals from Latin America entering the United States and call on the federal government to implement a system where people seeking refuge in our country, regardless of where they come from, have immediate access to the documentation they need, work authorization to achieve self-sufficiency and visibility in our society. And... We honor Latino Heritage Month uh, with this year and continuing to welcome, embrace, and celebrate our Latino community as a source of our city's strength by advocating for the end of the oppression of the Latino community and recognizing the formidable achievement of the Latino community in Minneapolis, the United States, and beyond. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby commemorate Latino Heritage Month to protect and uplift the voices, visions, and contributions brought forward by Latinos throughout Minneapolis, the United States, and the world. Thank you all. So thank you very much, Council Member Chavez and the council um, for this resolution. My name is Michelle Rivero. I'm the co-executive sponsor of the SOMOS Employee Resource Group. And who's next? And my name is Justo Garcia. Um, and again, I echo thank you, Council Member Chavez, and all these council members for your continued support, really, to uh, our, our, our Latino and our immigrant uh, community.
The Somos Employee Resource Group was created in 2018 and has been and aspires to be a home for Latino, Latina, Latinx, and Latine identifying employees and those interested in Latino heritage here in the city of Minneapolis. Many of us are also city of Minneapolis residents and some are involved in activities building power within the Latin American community across the city and across the state. This year, SOMOS has created a rich calendar of events and we invite all city staff to participate, including a Salsa y Salsa dancing and salsa competition today at noon, a Spanish 101 language class, a Colombian cooking event, a Latino leaders panel conversation, and more. We dedicate, our, we thank our many SOMOS members who have dedicated time to planning this rich and diverse programming for city staff to learn more about Latino culture. Uh, there are crises impacting Latin American communities right now. And this year's Latino Heritage Month offer opportunity to pair our enthusiasm and desire to celebrate Latino culture with action. Somos invite people to consider the impact of Huracan Fiona on the residents of the island of Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. Minnesotans are right now uh, delivering care and helping to offer emergency uh, relief. Please learn more about ways to offer help. Also, on the subject of uh, busing uh, yeah, from uh, southern border, Many of the people being transported from southern border to the, uh, of the United States by governors of Texas, Arizona, Florida, and to cities like New York and Chicago are Latino. We must treat fellow humans with dignity and humanity and identity in ways to offer support. One important way is through advo advocacy. Uh, as community member who have family uh, migration journey to the United States and who have worked to welcome newcomers to our city, we know that the pathway to independence and self-sufficiency must include grant of work authorization. Individuals with roots in Latin America represent a community filled with beauty, ingenuity, faith in providence, resilience, and courage. And we are proud for this opportunity to celebrate Latino Heritage Month. We welcome you to take part in events taking place this month, um, including in the city of Minneapolis, including Taco Tour on Lake Street on September 24th. We, as we celebrate the myriad contributions of our Latino community, we must remember that the fight for respect is not yet won. La lucha sigue, the fight continues. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and then I think now we have the council president. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, and we do have one more additional um, honorary resolution honoring uh, the legacy of Barbara Satin. And I'm wondering if uh, Barbara is here or anyone from, oh, from the in National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Hello. Um, if it's okay, I think I am just going to stand, um, sit here and read this resolution and then we'll come down and take photos. Um, so this resolution honoring the legacy of Barbara Satin, whereas, Barbara Satin, a transgender activist who has worked on issues of aging, faith, and gender justice, will retire from a long and successful career in advocacy and step down as the Faith Work Director at the National LGBTQ Task Force, where her responsibilities included working for the full inclusion of trans persons in communities of faith. And whereas... Barbara Sadden was the first transgender member of the executive committee of the National United Church of Christ, the governing body of one of the oldest Christian denominations in the country, and 
Whereas Barbara Satin has been an iconic activist and leader in our queer aging community, Barbara Satin was a founding member of GLBT Generations, a Minnesota coalition working for elder justice in the LGBTQIA community. And whereas Barbara provided leadership for the development of Spirit on Lake, a LGBTQ senior housing project in Minneapolis, the 46-unit affordable rental facility opened in September 2013, and at the time was the only, I'm sorry, at the time was only the second such project in the United States, an early and pioneering project in the growing field of advocacy and creating housing for LGBTQ elders and whereas Barbara Satin has sat on over 100 Minnesota nonprofit boards, chairing many of them. Included in these are the Landmark Center, P Fund, GLBT Generations, and several other nonprofits that serve LGBTQ people in the areas of community activism, philanthropy, training of senior care providers, and HIV AIDS services. And whereas Barbara Satin was one of the founders and the first president of the City of Lakes Cross Gender Community, one of the first Twin Cities transgender organizations, and whereas in February 2015, Barbara was invited to the White House to talk to the administration about housing concerns for LGBTQ seniors, and in July 2015, was one of three LGBT Q people invited to participate for the first time in the White House Conference on Aging and subsequently appointed to the Presidential Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships in 2016 by President Barack Obama. And whereas in January 2021, she participated as a prayer leader for President Biden's inaugural breakfast and Whereas in 2022, the task force focused on passage of the Equality Act, Satin recruited faith leaders in eight states to meet with senators about its importance and to ensure their voices were heard through the media with the clarion calls for the federal solution to the ongoing problem of discrimination. And whereas... Barbara Satin has been described by her peers as a fourth force of radical faith, a faith that is open, fierce, welcoming, and transformative. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby recognize and honor the legacy and the retirement of longtime faith leader Barbara Satin following decades of leadership and advocacy for LGBTQ people of faith, elders, and transgender communities. Congratulations on your years of service, Barbara Satin. And I will invite representative from the National Task Force to come up and accept this resolution and maybe share a few words. If you want to say a couple of more words about Ms. Satin. Sure. Thank you so much, Council President Jenkins and the Council. Um, my name is Sayer Reese. I'm the Director of Executive Projects and Planning at the National LGBTQ Task Force. Um, as you know, the Task Force is the nation's oldest national LGBTQ advocacy organization, founded in 1973. We have a long history with Minnesota, and particularly Minneapolis, and we have been profoundly blessed to have Barbara as a part of the Task Force for over 15 years as 
uh, wearing many hats, the latest as our faith work director. The, t the task force had a home here in Minneapolis. Our Office of Institute for Welcoming Resources was here for many years. Um, we consider Minneapolis a home, having had our conference here, Creating Change. We'll celebrate in 2011. That's right. Gosh, it's been so long, hasn't it? Um, we'll celebrate Barbara on Wednesday at a retirement party here um, and again at the Creating Change Conference in February, which we hope you'll all come to. Um, one of Barbara's lasting legacies is her work with the Institute of Welcoming Resources, which you can visit at welcomingresources.org uh, and the task force at thetaskforce.org. And we're just supremely grateful for this honoring of her retirement, her legacy, and that, and that you all shared her with us um, for so many years. Her legacy is, is big here in Minnesota. Minnesota, but it goes beyond across the country and even internationally with her asylum work. So um, this is not goodbye. She is uh, continuing her work, uh, just not in the capacity as faith work director. So thank you for this honor. Well, I'm sad that she wasn't able to be here this morning, but I'm looking forward to seeing her next week. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. All right, now that we have dispensed with our ceremony, colleagues, uh, the agenda for today's meeting is before us, and I will um, ask for any amendments to the agenda. Are there any amendments to today's agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adopt today's agenda. So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. The next item of business is the acceptance of the minutes from our regular meeting on September 8th and the adjourned meeting on September 14th, may I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and those minutes have been adopted, um, accepted. Finally, we have the referrals of petitions, communications, and reports from the proper committees. May I have that motion, please? So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember uh, Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and um, the next order of business is reports from our standing committees, beginning with the report from the Biz Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee, or the Biz Committee. The report will be presented by the committee's vice chair, Council Member Osmond. Thank you, Madam President. The Business and Inspection and Housing and Zoning Committee is recommending 10 items for approval this week's council meeting. Item one, approving application for a cruise market. Item two, denying a variance appeal submitted by Ferran Carbanda for 1218 Summit Avenue. Item three, considering a food manufacturer license provocation for a pair of dice pizza. Item four, considering a restaurant license provocation for Harry's site original Caribbean restaurant. Item five, approving 46 liquor license renewal. Approving uh, item six, approving gambling license for Minneapolis Riverview Lions. Item seven, approving nine Great Street facade, facade 
Grant Program Administration Funding Award, item A, approving the adequacy for environmental assessment worksheet for the proposed Upper Northwest, North, Northwestern Surgical and Critical Care Pavilion, approving the determination that an environment impact isn't required and adopting finding as prepared by CBED. Item nine, authorizing forgivable loan for Minneapolis American Indian Center expansion project as part of the Clyde Belcourt Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative. And item 10, passage resolution approving modification to 2021 special legislation, legislation fund tax increment spend, spending plan and authorizing transfer of funds. I'll move all items for approval and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Osmond has moved the approval of that committee's report. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Brainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. Next, we'll have the report from our Committee of the Whole. That report will be presented by the Chair, Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam President. There is only one item coming before us for approval this morning, and that's our next year's calendar uh, for regular meetings. So this confirms the calendar that is uh, published and before you, it directs the clerk to publish and post those calendars in final form, and it also authorizes the clerk to incorporate changes as necessary to accommodate our work. I'll move that for approval. Thank you, Council Vice President Palmasano. Is there any discussion? Council Vice President has moved that report. Any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. Next, we have the report from our Policy and Government Oversight Committee. That report will be presented by the Chair, Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 20 items uh, that it will be recommending for approval. Uh, item one is passage of a resolution related to uh, an assistant city clerk appointment. Two, passage of a resolution related to joint powers agreement with, state, with the state of Minnesota, Department of Public Safety. Three, passage of resolution related to gift acceptance of sponsorships for the 2022 Trans Equity Summit. Four, National Endowment for the Arts grant to support personnel expenses related to COVID-19. Five, customization of contract form with Gallagher Benefit Services, Inc. for classification and compensation consulting services. Six, customization of contract form with Core Data Healthcare Innovations, LLC uh, for cloud-based technology. Seven, bid for Minneapolis Convention Center uh, exhibit, eight, exhibit Hall E door replacement. Uh, eight, contracts with various vendors for 2023 through 2026 Public Works Consulting Pool. Nine, contracts with uh, Dirad Technologies, Inc. for an interactive voice response system for the 311 department. 10, contracts with Short Elliott Hendrickson, Inc. for construction support services for Hennepin Avenue reconstruction project. Uh, 11, contract with Geographic Software Specialist, Inc. for engineering data integration and automation services. 12, contract amendment with Vite and Company, Inc. for the Bryant Avenue reconstruction project. 13, contract amendment with Lunda Construction Company for 10th Avenue Southeast River Bridge Rehabilitation Project. 14, contract amendment with Paragon Restoration 2, Inc. for the 11th and Marquette Ramp Epoxy Overlay uh, Helices Project. Um, 15, contract amendment with the West Publishing Corporation for Online Legal Research Services. 
16 contract amendment with Smart Data Solutions Inc. for scanning, record labeling, and data transfer services. 17 lease amendment with the Hennepin Healthcare System for access at fire station number 22. 18 lease agreement uh, for clear channel billboards. Uh, 19 is a request for proposal for the Hiawatha maintenance facility demolition. Uh, this item did not uh, was not forwarded with a recommendation from the uh, committee. Uh, and 20 uh, contract amendment with RSP Architects Limited for design work for Public Works Hiawatha Campus Expansion Project. Uh, and so I'll stand for any questions or uh, discussion on uh, the POGO agenda. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Councilmember Ellison has moved the committee's report. Is there any discussion? I see Councilmember Chavez in queue. Yes, thank you, Council President and Chair Ellison. I wanna pull out number 19 relating to the RFP for demolition for a separate vote and discussion. Thank you, um, Council Member. Um, certainly, we can do that. I do want to just make a general announcement um, that the rules of the City Council do not allow for public comments at meetings of the full Council. Members of the public have the opportunity to comment on City business at a community level. The purpose of the Council meeting is to conduct the business of the City. Consistent with our rules, those who disturb these proceedings and interfere with the ability of the City Council to conduct this city business will be asked to leave. Those who refuse to follow these instructions will be removed from the chamber. This will serve as a general warning to those who would disrupt this meeting. I have advised that the interference of the city council's ability to conduct the city's business will be removed. The public may attend and observe these proceedings. However, the law prohibits disruption and interference. Those who do so will be removed. Mr. Clerk, I am going to call a resource of this committee's um, for 15 minutes. Thank you.
Colleagues, the recess has ended. The recess has ended, colleagues. I will entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting till 1 p.m. this afternoon. So moved. We have a motion to adjourn this meeting until 1 p.m. and a proper second. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 No. Any opposed? Aye. No. Aye. Clerk, can we have a voice? I mean, I. Um, can we call the roll, please? Yep. Councilmember Chavez. Nay. Councilmember Ellison. Nay. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Nay. Councilmember Johnson. Nay. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. No. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are seven ayes and five nays. Colleagues, we are adjourned till 1 p.m.